Let's turn to the book of Ezra, chapter 6. Once again, Ezra, chapter 6. Last time we got down to verse 12, and we left off by observing that King Darius of the Persian Empire, he completely equips the Jews for the rebuilding of their temple uh, once they had returned back to the land of Palestine. And it said there they received stones and timber in verse 4 to go into the construction. And then we read rams, lambs, bullocks, wheat, salt, and wine also provided to them in verse 9. And then later in chapter 7, verse 22, which we haven't got to yet, but there also it also lists oil, silver, wheat, and salt as well. Uh, through an unbelieving Gentile king, the Jews enjoy the promise of Philippians 4.19 just the same. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. By the way, have you ever thought that that verse says all your need, not all your greed? You don't just go to God and ask for whatever you want and uh, expect that he's going to do it or demand that he does it. That's the wrong attitude to approach the holy God of the universe. And yet, people will do it all the time. God, give me this. God, give me that. And God might be asking, well, give me some thanks if I do. That always escapes them. But they are certainly great, quick to demand things. But the question um, has arisen, how are the... Uh, well, it says there, my God shall... I said... Uh, Philippians 4, and my God shall supply all your need uh, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And a Gentile king helping the Jews to rebuild. You can see the prophetic implications when we get to the, after the rapture and the tribulation ensues. And the question has arisen, how are the Jews going to be able to tear down the Muslims' uh, Dome of the Rock to rebuild? Until you can imagine the political firestorm that that would uh, set off. And the simple answer uh, is that on the ground, right outside the wailing wall, the western wall, we, we've all seen the images of Jews praying and putting pieces of paper with their prayer request in the cracks of uh, that wall, and that's said to be the, the last remaining uh, wall of the temple that stood at Christ, in Christ's day. Everything else was stone, torn down, and the stones themselves, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the stones themselves were restacked and erected into that wall uh, sometime after 70 A.D. Because Christ said not a, a stone would be, uh, un, uh, um, no stone unturned, no stone left unturned. And so, right out in that, that uh, plaza, that court, um, it's conceivable that the Jews could erect another structure there. Um, consider this. It doesn't have to be a stone, timber, brick, or mortar temple in order to be scriptural. Now, I'll give you a couple of reasons or verses to support that statement. Go back, if you will, first to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel 7, and notice there, just one verse, verse 6. Well, let's read verses 5 and 6. Here God tells Nathan the prophet, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent, and in a tabernacle. Well, that's plain enough. But go back to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel 1, and let's begin there at verse 8. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, to her, Hannah, Why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Well, to a woman who longs to have a child, uh, no. 
The answer is no. Your husband is, can't quite do what a, a baby in your arms would do for you with a motherly instinct. But continue, verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat, notice, by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Well, that was the portable, movable tabernacle or tent God said he had been dwelling in up to that point. There was no temple built yet. And yet God uses the word temple to describe the tabernacle. So being the King James believers that we are, we can see how a, a tabernacle structure could be erected in less than 48 hours by the Jews if they were given the green light um, by the man of sin, which they will undoubtedly be. They could erect that in a very little time, and it would still be scriptural, using the King James language uh, to inform our understanding. It would still be a fulfillment of a temple in the tribulation. Um, now let's continue in our text, back to Ezra 6, and let's read verses 13, 14, and 15. Then Tatnai, governor on this side of the river, Shethar, Boznai, and their companions, according to that which Darius the king had sent, so they did speedily. And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel, and according to the commandment of Cyrus, and Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month, Adar, which was in the sixth year in the reign of Darius the king. Notice the Jews' enemies make haste to help the Jews in their building project. Verse 13 says, so they did speedily. Well, why were the enemies of, of the Jews suddenly decide, we're going to help the Jews rebuild? Well, that would certainly be due to the threat Darius issued. Look at, back at verse 11. Also, I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house, and being set up, let him be hanged thereon, and let his house be made a dunghill for this. Well, they certainly didn't want that to happen. So that was the, that was the motivation. That was the motive for them uh, agreeing to assist the Jew in their time of rebuilding. Verse 15 also says, And this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar. This would be at the end of the Jews' uh, religious calendar, roughly late February, uh, early March perhaps. The next month would be the month of Abib, mentioned in, I think, the book of Exodus, uh, later also called Nisan in the Old Testament, but, uh, which, was the, which is, corresponds on our calendar roughly to uh, the middle of March or the month of March. Do you realize that March used to be the first month in the old world calendar? And it wasn't until uh, the year, believe it or not, it wasn't until the year 2000, or everybody was saying Y2K and that the millennium was going to start uh, once the clock rolled over from 1999 to 2000. It actually didn't. The millennium started on January 1st, 2001. But most people, they like the even number 2000, and they got all excited. But uh, be that as it is, 2000, January 1st, 2000, was the very first time, the first century in the history of the world, that the entire world was now on the same calendar, beginning with January and ending with December. Back in 1900, there were still some nations observing the old world calendar where the month of March was the beginning of the next calendar year. And we see remnants of that old calendar in our, on our, uh, in our months even now. Uh, September, October, November, December, those four months mean um, 7, 8, 9, 10. December is the 12th month on our calendar now, but it used to be the 10th month. And then January, February would follow, and the, approximately the month of March was the start of a new calendar year. But um, verses 16, well, the first month of the Jews' religion... Abi, the month Abi, the next month following, was also the month of the Passover. 
Um, let's go to, let's continue reading it, starting at verse 16, and we'll read down through the rest of this chapter. And the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity, kept the dedication of this house of God with joy, and offered at the dedication of this house of God an hundred bullocks, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs, and for a sin offering for all Israel, twelve he goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions, and the Levites in their courses, for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the fourteenth day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites were purified together, all of them were pure, and killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity, and for their brethren the priests, and for themselves. And the children of Israel, which were come again out of captivity, and all such as had separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land, to seek the Lord, of, uh, the Lord God of Israel, did eat, and kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had made them joyful, and turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them, to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Most of this section is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we'll have you notice in verse 17, it says, A sin offering for all Israel, by the middle of the verse there. This was a national offering for a nation. This was not a sin offering for any individual's sins. Let's read verse 16 again. And the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. It says they kept the dedication of the house of God. The date of this event was kept through the centuries, and uh, it shows up in the New Testament in the Gospel of John. It's referred to as the Feast of Dedication, John 10, verse 22. Uh, compare also uh, the, the differences in the dedications. Here, they slew 100 bullocks, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and 12 he goats. But under Solomon's dedication at his temple, we read that at his dedication, they slew 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. There's quite a, a um, decline in the religious emphasis on part of the people. Uh, what a sort of a degenerated, uh, degenerate uh, collapse in the building of the first temple and the magnificence of it and the building of this second temple after 70 years in captivity. You know, evolution is one got to be one of the most ridiculous words ever thrust upon the English-speaking world. Nothing evolves. Things wear out over time. They fall apart. They get old. They get rusty. They deteriorate. They break apart. They are weather-worn. They are... They... they cease to function on their own. You, if you don't start your gasoline engine for a while, that gasoline goes bad in the tank. The rest of the engine may be fine, but uh, little by and, and given enough time, the engine itself will rust and decay and fall apart. Things don't evolve or improve on their own automatically. They deteriorate, they degenerate automatically without any help at all. Man has to get involved to sort of turn it back around and reverse it once again, time and time again, and then tell himself that it happened by itself. It, it, it doesn't. Nothing evolves. Things deteriorate. And the same, unfortunately, the, the same principle seems to apply itself to spiritual life, someone's spiritual life. Think of the, well, the, um, in 1611, King James published uh, his Bible, which we believe in, which we preach and use. And for the next uh, three and a half centuries, for the next 350 years, virtually every Anglican or Episcopalian here, 
every Presbyterian, every Methodist, every Baptist, every Lutheran, um, every Pentecostal in the 20th century, they all preached and taught out of the same Bible. And for them, that was the word of God. They didn't feel the need to keep updating it every two and a half years or every three years like the publishers do now. And they didn't uh, set about to correct it and change it and modify it and update it and, and uh, just adjust it where they thought necessary to fit their denominational beliefs. Back in Billy Graham's early preaching days, early, mid-1950s, he could have a citywide campaign in a stadium somewhere, and Presbyterians and Methodists and even Lutherans and Congregationalists and probably some Episcopalians could all get behind him and support it. Because the, the gospel is such a simple proposition that the Savior wants to save and forgive sinners who will trust in him and his work on Calvary and his blood shed on their behalf. It's for such a very simple proposition. Now, denominational differences aside, all of those churches could uh, support Billy Graham because he was preaching out of the same Bible which, that they preached out of in their own churches every Sunday. And he didn't cloud it with some particular sliver of Baptist specialization or pet doctrine. Um, he, was a, he was set about to be an evangelist and win souls to Christ. But uh, as people got away from the same Bible, they began to splinter off, and their faith is, is uh, weak if you can even find it. And I find it interesting that those of us who call ourselves King James Bible-believing Christians, Bible-believing Baptists, uh, we still believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God. We, we never saw the need to adopt some new translation. Somehow, we're the heretics in everybody else's eyes. I think they're the heretics. They're the ones who left uh, a standing position once upon a time and now have no need for it. And all they can do is name call those of us who still believe in it. But um, can compare, compare Billy Graham in 1956 to the way Billy Graham had become by 2006, 60 years later. Um, I, I can't believe anyone would say he improved. Think of the great revivalists a uh, hundred years ago. Think of, well, Mordecai Ham, under whose preaching Billy Graham got saved, and uh, Billy Sunday, and preachers back to uh, 1918 versus 2018. Things don't get better. Things continually get worse, gradually get worse. And uh, all the modern translations. Um, and I think God, now, I still think there's the possibility for individual revival, revival in someone's family, uh, revival within a local church, and maybe in a few rare instances, even the revival of a town. It would probably be a small town somewhere, probably down the Bible Belt, maybe. But as far as national revivals, I don't understand how the charismatics can say we're on television 24-7 and God's great, this great move of, of, uh, of revival taking place. I don't see it, and nor do they see it. They're, they're deceiving themselves. But as far as a national revival, I think God's written, written uh, uh, Ichabod, the glory has departed from the United States. I don't see how anyone could interpret it any other way. If, if we were ready for a national revival, it'd mean we'd be ready to outlaw abortion in all of its forms nationwide. We'd be ready to reverse uh, queer marriage and outlaw that in all of its forms. We'd be ready to commit all of these so-called transgender, I don't know what I am, people to insane asylums yeah. where they belong. Um, but, uh, and you just run down, you and I could probably, could each uh, make lists of things that would have to be reversed uh, in the wake of a great national revival. And I don't see any sign of it ever happening. However, uh, revivals of the, of the individual, the family perhaps, the local church, and maybe even in a few instances, a uh, small town somewhere. That's entirely, you know, um, 
Billy Sunday would come into town and preach hard against liquor, against drunkenness, and the jails would empty out and people would start lowering their voices if they wanted to curse on a public sidewalk. All kinds of signs, but that that doesn't happen. Um, these Rick Warrens and Joel Osteens and even Greg Lorries, as uh, good speakers as they are in their respective ways, they don't affect any sort of sweeping change um, in society at large because of sin and the preaching against sin. And so now an individual can come under conviction and still not be admonished to turn from sin like he ought to. And thank God for those that get saved in some of those places. But a sweeping revival, no, I think that's, that's a thing of the past. But verse 18, actually, let me give you an evidence of that. I told you three months ago <clears throat> that um, Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, California, was planning to relocate to Pomona, California. Uh, and this is just an aside. This is just an aside based on my, my daily observations. Uh, Pomona is nicknamed P-Town by the gang members. So they're moving from one P-Town to another P-Town, from Pasadena to Pomona. And Pomona was sort of a small-scale Pasadena back in the 50s. It was a nice, quaint, very clean place to go. But I can't walk outside, walk up the public sidewalk anywhere downtown Pomona without smelling urine because there's so many homeless people everywhere. My place of business or my place of employment is right on the north east corner of Gary Avenue and Holt Avenue. Um, across the street from us, uh, north of Holt Avenue, is what used to be First Baptist Church of Pomona. Now it's called Purpose Church. Not a purpose or church with a purpose, but the minister there was so involved with Rick Warren's purpose-driven church thing, he decided we need to change our name. The word Baptist is slowing us down. We only have 1,400 people coming on Sundays, and he said, we need to grow. So they've changed their name. Caddy Corner from us across the intersection, on the southwest corner, there's an old former Crocker Bank building. It's been sitting vacant for several years. For a couple of years, it was, this, it was the, um, a specialty high school. You know, these specialty schools where they teach kids uh, uh, welding or they, keep, they emphasize music or they emphasize drama. Well, this was uh, one of these specialty high schools that emphasized hip-hop. It was a high school of hip-hop. Teach kids how to break dance and, you know, do mixing on the, on the, on the uh, turntable like these rappers do. And, uh, of course, that closed about as quickly as it opened, uh, thankfully. Well, that building, right catty corner from my place of business, and the entire block that it's, in which it sits is the new future location for, for um, Fuller Seminary. And uh, right there on Holt Avenue, just past the old First Baptist Church, there is an old Bob's Big Boy. It's been closed for several years now. Well, that church had bought the Bob's Big Boy restaurant because they wanted to use the parking for additional parking at their services. Well, Fuller has bought that. And all this was recently in the newspaper. And uh, Charles Fuller was an old-time fundamentalist. He was a King James-believing preacher, very evangelistic. And... Um, his program was called the Old Fashioned Gospel Hour on the radio. In 1947, he started Fuller uh, Seminary. I don't know if he even called it seminary in those days, but Fuller uh, Bible School, Bible Institute, Fuller Seminary in Pasadena. He said, uh, people in our camp, uh, we love the Lord, we preach the Word of God, we believe the Word of God, but not everyone in our camp has as much education as maybe they ought to have in order to function in this modern world. The world's changing all around us. And it might have been something as simple as learning how to read and write better and understand English grammar more, more correctly and precisely, uh, or just have a broader knowledge of the world around you and, and church history and, and uh, why we believe certain things we believe. And a lot of preachers around the country who never studied anything. That's God just told them to preach, and they started preaching. 
And he said, our people in our camp need a little bit more polish. And so that's the purpose of his school, to train preachers to have a little bit more on the ball, to still believe the Bible from cover to cover. Well, I printed an article out of our local paper just uh, from a few days ago. Actually, this was yesterday's paper. Pomona Bank, which I mentioned, the former Bob's Big Boy, all bought by Fuller Seminary. And it says uh, they bought that bank building for $2.5 million. And, uh, of course, this article was written by David Allen. He's the humor writer for the local paper. But he says... Um, I'm not sure which was more surprising, that a vacant Bob's Big Boy was owned by the former First Baptist Church or that, or that what may be the world's best-known religious training school, which educates in 110 denominations. Fuller Seminary caters to 110 denominations. And so whether you're a Charismatic or a Southern Baptist or a Dutch Reform uh, or, or a Roman Catholic, Everybody finds some way to fit in. They have homosexual student groups at Fuller Seminary. The place has Ichabod written over it uh, decades ago. Now they're going to bring it here to Pomona, California. And I'm not kidding you. That It's just diagonal from my, my uh, place of business during the week. Now the pastor at that former First Baptist Church, he's very excited about it. He thinks it's a great uh, addition to Pomona because they're going to fit right in with the Pomona Colleges and Claremont Colleges and all of these highbrow, uh, high intellectual education facilities. All of those places are hell holes as well. I told you about Rick Warren graduated from Fuller Seminary. And uh, he's a Southern Baptist by, by ordination. But I don't know if he preaches the gospel or he could even explain it clearly. And uh, I told you Robert Schuler's son, Robert Schuler Jr., also graduated from Fuller. He was, I turned on TBN one night and he had um, Jack Van Impey was his, was his guest. He was the guest host. Jack Van Impey was his guest. And they're sitting across the, the sofa, you know how they used to set up. And Jack Van Impey was going into the tribulation explaining Bible prophecy and coming events. And Robert Schuller Jr. said, wow, that's, that's fascinating. All of this is very interesting because I've never heard any of this before. And that fool was, was, was uh, naive enough to say such words on national television. I've never heard any of this before. That means he wasn't taught it at Fuller Seminary. He wasn't taught it in the sort of the Dutch Reformed denomination his father belonged to. He didn't learn any of it. And um, it says they, they have about 1,200, 1,900 students that will also be relocating out this way and probably looking for local apartments and so on. That intersection, right where my place of business is, is ground zero for the shopping cart, homeless people, and the, uh, what do we call them, ladies of the night, ladies of the daytime, uh, all day long. Uh, and, and I, I go to work, and um, I see bums laying on the public sidewalk just sleeping. Not even a blanket over them. They just decided they're ready for a nap, and they did wherever they are. Um, and, and my whole point, I'm, I've, dig I've digressed a little bit, so forgive me, but the idea of a national revival of this school is somehow going to train champions for the Lord Jesus Christ is, is laughable. They're not, they haven't in decades, and they won't be doing any, any uh, such training in the future. Might as well go back to the high school of hip hop, and get about as much spirituality out of it. But verse 18, I'm gonna try to move along here. Verse 18 says, and they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. This will be described in details back in 1 Chronicles 24, 25, and 26, if you want to look at that separately. And then verses 19 and 20, they show the Passover was observed after the temple was completed. 
Pentateuch, and the details of that will be listed not only in the book of Exodus as the Jews came out of Egypt, Exodus 20 and 21, um, but also Leviticus 23, the days of unleavened bread following the Passover. Now lastly, the king of Assyria, mentioned there in verse 22, along with the, phrase, the king of Babylon, chapter 5, verse 13, and the king of Persia, chapter 4, verse 24, which means that, uh, that, that Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria, and that he was mentioned there in verse uh, 22 at the, end of the, at the end of this text, he was a type of the Antichrist and the seven heads of the, of the uh, beast described in uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, seven heads on the dragon. And we talked about that, I think, not long ago. Uh, seven great uh, emperors ruling over history, human history, uh, from, uh, Neb from Pharaoh in Egypt um, all the way up to the man of sin in the tribulation. And uh, those three kings were a part of that, those, those seven uh, heads, uh, historically. And uh, I'm going to leave it at that, and we'll stop there. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to launch in chapter 7 next time we meet.